Tonight's program is part of Farm Bureau's continued efforts to help members gain the resources and information to be better farmers and business people. By bringing together our great partners nationwide in Farm Credit Mid-America, the next several minutes are gonna give you a chance to gain insight and ask questions to best manage against financial risk. So welcome to tonight's presentation. I'm glad that you all could join us. I'm actually gonna turn it over to Tim Hicks with Ohio Farm Bureau, who will guide us through the program. Uh, I'm looking forward to tonight's program. Uh, we've got some uh, great presenters and great speakers, uh, 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 folks from Mid-America, Farm Credit Mid-America, and the Hummel Group will be kind of uh, guiding us through and being our subject matter experts. And hopefully you'll get some good information um, that will uh, better prepare you kind of uh, moving forward. So as I mentioned, uh, tonight's program, uh, we're gonna have Lee Heron and Micah Mensing with Farm Credit Mid America. And they're really gonna set up the kind of the basics of managing financial risk. They're gonna go over uh, a few things from the financial side uh, to really level set to make sure that we're all operating from the same platform. Uh, and then we're going to kick it over to Evan Hirschberger uh, and Carl Schlebaugh with the Hummel Group. Uh, we're going to talk farm liability risks and uh, uh, talk about a financial risk management tool uh, and tools that you might be able to kind of uh, use and leverage within your operation uh, to make improvements and lead towards uh, a better financial security for you and your family and your operation. Uh, there are additional programs on retirement planning and on farm transition planning. Uh, these are all, as Kayla mentioned, these are all efforts that we're putting into place to uh, connect our best partners with our members um, and, and be that connected tissue between the two uh, to help improve uh, in the security of Ohio's ag community. I'm gonna now go ahead and turn the, tonight's program over to Lee Heron uh, and Micah Mensing with Farm Credit Mid-America. So with that, Lee, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Good evening, thanks, uh, Tim. Thanks, Kayla, for having us. Uh, glad to be a part of tonight's session and hopefully share some insights on uh, financial risk management and how to, to offset those risks. So first wanted to you know, give a brief background. Many of you know, you know our local offices, but want to give you a bigger picture of Farm Credit Mid-America overall. Uh, We've got over uh, 24 billion in assets or loan volume uh, out there in, in our four states and about 85,000 customers, uh, about 1,300 employees and 80 retail offices spread over Ohio, Indiana, Kentucky, and Tennessee with our headquarters based in Louisville, Kentucky. All right. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Mike Mensing. I'm the Ohio Growing Forward Specialist, um, and, th and thanks again for having us. Uh, I wanted to tell you a little bit about our Growing Forward program. Growing Forward is our uh, program specifically for young and beginning farmers. So if you're in that range where you're just getting uh, the opportunity to make some of those business decisions on your operation, uh, this program is really designed for you. There's a couple different components, that being our educational benefit of being a part of uh, Growing Forward. Uh, and so we do a lot of seminars and in an educational conference where we really break down financials for customers. We have relaxed underwriting standards that then pair with uh, that conference and the loans that are uh, pushed through growing forward. And then we also offer business planning support. And so we require all of our customers to engage in business planning uh, when they when they do go through growing forward and request funds, uh, just so that we can ensure that everybody's uh, on, the, on the straight and narrow and, and heading towards a successful direction when we do lend them money and, and able to achieve uh, what they wanna achieve. Right now in the Ohio Growing Forward portfolio, we have about, uh, in the Growing Forward portfolio as a whole, we have about $362 million out there to those individuals that are 35 years or younger or have less than 10 years of farming experience. Tonight, we're going to talk about uh, financial risk management and uh, what that looks like from a lender's perspective. And so, as Tim had mentioned, we're going to try to make tonight as interactive as possible. And one of the ways that we can do that is by you all engaging with us. And so, Lee's going to watch the chat box here uh, when, I, when I'm presenting, and I'm going to do the same for him. So, our very first question is going to be, what do you think the top three causes of default for Farm Credit Mid-America customers are? So when an individual is not able to pay their, their loan uh, or pay their bill, what do you think the three reasons of default really are? So we, we really have it broken down here into three categories, sudden death or accident, 
divorce or family dynamics, and inability to withstand market volatility. So everything that you all said really hits it right, the nail right on the, the head, uh, because all three of those are, are are serious risks that happen on the operation. And so tonight, uh, Lee and I are gonna talk you through how do you uh, mitigate some of that risk from a financial perspective so that uh, when you go to your lender that you can be confident that your risk is mit mitigated and also be able to understand uh, what your lender is looking for in, in risk. Yeah, and really Carl and Evan are gonna talk a little bit about that first one, that sudden death or accident and with life insurance products and, and other things. and. Uh, divorce and family dynamics are kind of a uh, more of a legal risk and, and you know, uh, more for an attorney to deal with. But we're going to really focus on that uh, inability to withstand market volatility uh, as, as our main uh, risk that, that we're going to focus on tonight. So as a lender, how, how do we look at making our decisions? You know, we look at opportunities and risk of your operation and, and make a decision of, of whether or not to, to loan to you. Uh, and, and it comes down to what we call the five C's of credit. And they're, they're listed right there, character, capital, capacity, collateral, and conditions. And, and we'll discuss those each in, in a lot more detail as we go through the presentation tonight. So the first one that we're gonna talk about is character. And you know, there's a great quote there from, by Henry Ford, uh, you can't build a reputation on what you're going to do. And really as, as a cooperative structure, cooperative uh, you know, entity ourselves, you know, really it comes down to, would you be willing to sign on the note for somebody else? And so we're looking at financial management. You know, how have you handled your money in the past? How have you set up loans, uh, built your, your net worth, those type of things as a, as a key principle under character? We're also gonna look at production management. You know, have you been a average producer, above average producer, or lo below average producer, you know, over, you know, the, your history of your farming operation? Uh, if you work an off-farm job, you know, we're going to look at your job history, whether or not that, that salary has been maintained or growing. Um, and then we're going to look at repayment reputation, uh, whether or not you've made your, your payments on time or not. Because if you haven't made your payments on time in the, in the past, what well, makes us think that you'll, you'll make those in time going forward? Then finally, uh, credit history or your credit score uh, is a key point that we're going to look at. And Mike is going to talk a little more on that. Yeah, so your credit score is something that uh, oftentimes we hear about it and we, we know it's this ambiguous number that's out there, but what actually makes up your credit score? And so uh, Lee and I are breaking that down here a little bit more for you. 35% of that is going to be your payment history or how, uh, how, how disciplined are you with paying those bills or those lines of credit that you have out there? 30% is going to be your outstanding credit over your limit. So when we think about exposure, if you have a $5,000 credit card, it is probably best to not expose that credit card all the way to $5,000. We really like to see credit exposures down in the 10, 10 to 20% range and not much more than that. So it's really important to understand what your credit limit is and, and manage that correctly. Another piece of that pie is the length of the relationship. So if you've had a card uh, for, for many, many years and you don't use it anymore, we wouldn't necessarily encourage you to just uh, to cancel the account completely uh, if it's not causing you any harm. In fact, we would encourage you to just shred the card, uh, keep the account, and uh, build up that length of a relationship that you have with that uh, credit, uh, credit company or, or whoever it may be. Then 10% on types of credit and credit inquiries. And so those types of credit is going to be, uh, what kind of variety do you have on your credit balance? Do you have a mortgage and credit cards and student loans? It's really important for the uh, credit associations to know that you've uh, lend money from a variety of organizations and a variety of types of credit, and you're reliable on all of those. And then again, that last 10% of credit inquiries is how often are, uh, banks or how often are organizations pulling a credit report on you. And so it is important to know that there is a difference in between a hard inquiry and a soft pull. Uh, and those hard inquiries are really what you want to stay stay away from. Those could be anything from uh, when you're looking to, to put a mortgage or to have a mortgage or any of those larger purchases that they really might need to get in the weeds of your credit score and, and figure out what you have going on. 
Now, is there a perfect score on, on a credit card that we look for and we make our credit decisions off of completely? Absolutely not. Your credit score is your financial GPA, and it tells us how likely you are to default in the next 24 months. But we are a relationship-based lender and an income-based lender. And so uh, we use this to tell just a little bit of the story uh, of your overall financial picture. And so we really like to see our customers in this 21% range of 670 to 739 in that good area of a credit score. Again, we will not make a credit decision simply based on this, but it is, uh, it is important that, that you're continuing to monitor your credit score and, and keeping yourself afloat uh, via that. Now, there are a couple resources, and you might be thinking, Mike, I don't even know where to get my credit score. And so we have a couple of resources outlined here. Um, annualcreditreport.com allows you to pull a report, I believe it is once a year for free without it affecting your credit bureau. Uh, your credit card company, a lot of the companies out there are offering that as a service now. Credit Karma and then also Mint. Mint is probably one of my favorites. It gives me a weekly report on my credit score uh, and also allows me to track my budgets and uh, in all of my expenses. And so um, those are some really great resources. And if you have questions about any of those, uh, I'd be happy to, to answer them. The next thing we're gonna talk about is capital. And so capital is, is really focusing on your net worth or, or the, the wealth that you've built in your your personal balance sheet or your, your, your company that you're running, your farm. Uh, and so what does your balance sheet tell us about your ability to bear risk? And so we're looking at some ratios there, working capital, current ratio, and solvency. And we'll get into more detail as we walk through this. So, you know, first, you know, first thing is, you know, we're going to look at your balance sheet and or financial statement. And I know a lot of times people, you know, will ask them for a balance sheet or financial statement and, and they just freeze up and they just don't know what, what to provide, uh, what it is it, or they feel like it's going to be really hard to do. And that's, you know, a great thing to, to walk through the first time with your financial officer and kind of help, they can help you build that balance sheet. But uh, we're going to talk through some pieces of that balance sheet here tonight as well. But what is it? it it's really a snapshot of your financial position at one point in time. So it's gonna be different from today to tomorrow or next week or, or a year from now. Uh, but it, it's really this point in time today of, of what is your current financial position and how much wealth has been accrued. It, it's a great tracking mechanism, not only for us, but, but for you personally and for your business. Uh, because you can say, okay, I can, I'll do a year end balance sheet, put it together. My net worth is $100,000 today. Uh, next year, at, at the end of the year, you want it to be greater than that, and, and it can, you know, if you do it again, it's going to show you how much you've grown that your financial position over that point in time. So it's a great way to track your financials over time, uh, year over year. So, you know, as we look at the balance sheet, it's really divided into quadrants. You know, the assets are going to be on the left, the liabilities are on, on the right. And assets are, are just another way to say, what is it that you own? So, you know, your checking accounts, savings accounts, um, you know, equipment, real estate, those type of things are, are your assets. Whether or not you have debt on them or not, we want to show them there as a current asset or a non-current asset. And then liabilities are what you owe, the debts that you have uh, for credit cards and, and equipment payments and, and real estate payments, those type of things. Uh, would be on the right-hand side. And then it's divided into current versus non-current, so top and bottom. So current assets are things that you're gonna turn into cash or you typically turn into cash within the next 12 months. So that would be grain on hand, um, market livestock, you know, accounts receivable, cash and, and checking accounts, those type of things you know, that are easily turned into cash and would typically be turned into cash within that next 12 months. While non-current assets would be things like equipment and, and real estate, uh, things that your retirement accounts, things that you're going to hold on to for a much longer period of time. And same thing on the liability side. Current liabilities would be those items that you're going to have to pay within the next 12 months. So that's going to be your credit cards, uh, your operating loan, uh, things like that that would be more of a short-term debt, uh, while non-current liabilities are equipment payments, real estate loans, 
uh, those longer term, but anything more than a year uh, term left on those, those debts. So that leads us to our next question here is, uh, where would I put credit card debt on a balance sheet? Current liability, absolutely. Y'all are y'all are so smart. Uh, so again, that credit card debt is going to be hopefully revolved here within uh, the next 12 months. So so that is correct. We're going to want to see that in that top right quadrant under current liabilities. This here is just a balance sheet that is a demo, and and Tim or and uh, Lee and I had made up for you uh, to be able to kind of get a picture of what a balance sheet could look like, and we're going to use it as an example as we go through some of the ratios that we look at as a financial institution, and and how do we predict whether a loan is a good loan to make or not. That very first one that we're going to talk about is going to be our current ratio, and so as uh, Lee had explained, our our on our balance sheet is our current assets minus our or over our current liabilities. Current assets are going to be all what's on the top, right? Because it's due within the next 12 months or it's uh, something that we're gonna convert into cash within the next 12 months. So we're gonna take our current assets, divide it by our current liabilities to get a ratio. Now what's important about that current ratio is it measures to the extent to which the current assets, if sold today, could pay off those liabilities. And so we really like to be able to see, uh, you know, when you have debt out, that you have assets that uh, kind of equal that same value, right? So if you're paying for something uh, off of your operating loan, we'd really like to be able to see that asset then on your balance sheet under current assets. So that could be things like chemical, fertilizer, uh, anything along those lines. Now, there isn't necessarily a specific uh, true target of what, what numbers do I need? It's really about uh, the risk levels and so under, less than 1% is really going to be uh, pretty concerning. We're gonna to have to start to ask some questions. One to 1.25, you're in that moderate risk level. Uh, you know, probably just need awareness of what, what you have going on. And then uh, more than 1.25 is, is really uh, no concern at all. And you're in that green, good to go uh, risk rating. Now, Fred Farmer, what we did is we took his top half of his balance sheet, we divided his current assets, that top left quadrant, over top of his current liabilities, that top right quadrant, and we, that was 400,000 divided by 76,000 and got 0.5. Two. So uh, as you can see, Fred is in this moderate risk rating uh, that or less than that, that we're gonna start to ask questions that, that really concerning risk rating, right? That we're gonna start to ask question and say, Fred, what's going on? Uh, well, where did all of this debt go, right? So where did you spend all your money but have no assets to actually uh, show for it on the current asset side of things at least? The next piece of that is working capital. So I like to think of them very similar. Um, one's just in a ratio. And so our working capital is our current assets. So again, that top half of the balance sheet minus our current liabilities instead of the divide like we did on the last one. What this tells us is the operation's uh, ability to withstand short-term adversity. And so when we think about market volatility and things that are happening in the market that we just can't control, your working capital is, is where you're able to overcome some of those challenges. And so oftentimes, you know, Lee and I will get questions, how much working capital do I have? It's really about the size of your operation. And, and Lee's gonna go over some examples of what, what specifically we mean by that uh, here in just a little bit. So if we take Fred Farmer's working capital of 40,000, we subtract 76,000. We know that Fred has a working capital balance of negative 36,000. And so his risk rating would be negative, right? He's uh, not in a good spot. He has more debt than he has current assets to be able to pay that debt back or offstand that debt. Um, and so he's really not in a good spot and we wanna have some conversations about uh, what, what he's got going on. The next piece of this is going to be solvency or equity to asset ratio is also what we call it. It measures the proportion of total assets financed by the customer. And so how we're gonna find that is we're gonna take our net worth from the balance sheet, we're gonna divide it by our total assets on the balance sheet. Why this is important is it really tells us about, uh, it tells us you know, how much ownership do you have in your operation versus how much ownership does the lender have in the operation. And so that's portrayed down here in your risk, uh, risk levels. 
we always say that, you know, we want you to be the majority owner of your operation. You're the one making the day-to-day -day business decisions. And so we want you to own most of your operation uh, most of the time, right? So with the customers that I work with, sometimes we have to reduce that, that, uh, that, that ratio just so that we can give young and beginning customers uh, a fair shot at getting started. Uh, but this is this is kind of our general population of, of what our risk rating could be. So for Fred Farmer, he's at a 58.5% risk uh, level. So he's doing pretty good, uh, not a huge amount of concern. Um, and so his solvency or his equity to asset ratio is, is doing pretty good for him. So as we review what we've just uh, discovered here for Fred Farmer is that Fred has a current ratio of 0.52%. Not very good. He has a negative working capital of $36,000, but his solvency is 58.5%. And so the next question that I have for you is what does this information tell us about Fred Farmer's risk tolerance? And this is another poll question that's gonna come up. So knowing what you do about his current ratio being 0.52, his working capital negative 36,000, and his solvency being pretty strong at 58. Uh, what does this tell us about Fred as a, as a credit worthy person? Fred has a low short term risk bearing uh, ability. All right, he is somebody that's probably not going to fare too well with, um, you know, market volatility and everything that's going on. But that long term risk bearing ability is pretty strong because of his pretty high percentage of solvency or equity to asset ratio. He has uh, quite a bit of ownership in his operation. Yeah, so some of the questions we might be asking Fred based on this information is, you know, why is his line of credit maxed out? Did he go buy a, a piece of equipment uh, with his operating line and we just need to term it out on, onto a longer term? Uh, you know, did he, did he have a bad crop year last year and that's what drove it up or the last couple years? So we're going to ask Fred some additional questions to really understand his operation and, and understand why his financials are the way they are today. So next we're gonna look at capacity and really capacity is, is looking at your earnings ratios, uh, look at your earnings statement and, and your size and scale uh, of your operation. So the, the first ratio we're gonna look at under, under capacity is liquidity. And so we're gonna look at uh, that working capital that, that Micah just talked about there and divided by that value of farm production. And so we look at value of farm production is that top number on your, on your uh, schedule F usually uh, of that gross income uh, from your farm operation. And really th what this is telling us is the ability of the operation to meet your short-term ob obligations uh, with current assets without disrupting the normal course of business. So really what, what we're getting at there is, you know, you, we don't want you to have to go sell a tractor or a piece of real estate in order to meet your short-term debt needs uh, to, to pay off your credit cards or your, your existing payments. So you know, how much working capital do you have in order to, to fit uh, your operation itself? And so how much is enough working capital? You know, so our calculations, you know, that risk levels again, that higher risk is less than 20%, that moderate risk is 20 to 30, and then, you know, doing really well is above 30%. So some examples of that. So let's say you have $400,000, and you have a have grain sales of one point five million dollars, that equate to twenty seven percent liquidity, uh, where that same you know one point five million dollars of grain sales, and you only have a hundred thousand dollars of of working capital would be six percent. So that would be in our higher risk tolerance group. And then finally, that same hundred thousand dollars of working capital as example two, but having only sales of $450,000, uh, you'd be in that moderate risk rating level at 22%. So we look at both that income and that working capital combined to, to kind of figure out where your risk tolerance is for your operation. And I think it's so important that you know, Lee and I stress to you that it is so different based on every operation, right? And so you really just have to sit down, do that size and scale of your operation, understand the value of farm production from those taxes uh, to really figure out where you should be, uh, where your quote unquote comfort level should be with how much do you have uh, build up in the savings or your rainy day fund, if you will.
Yeah, and, and it's different too if you have a livestock operation where you're like a dairy operation where you're getting monthly milk checks versus a grain operation where you're selling once or twice a year. Uh, that definitely uh, you know plays into how big that rate that number needs to be. So the next ratio we're going to look at is the debt coverage ratio, and we like to call that their profitability. And it's really measuring the ability of the operation to cover all your expenses that are that are coming out of the operation. So your operating expenses, the taxes, uh, family living expense, what you need to live on because you, you do need to live off, off the income as well, and then your principal debt payments as well. So it's a complex calculation. Uh, we're using numbers from the income statement to determine that repayment capacity there. So, you know, really what we're getting at is for every dollar of debt do I that I have, how much extra do I have to cover it? You know, we wanna make sure that, that you have enough income to cover your, those debt payments. So we're gonna take that, that total net income off your Schedule F. Uh, we're gonna subtract out, you know, the cost of family living. Uh, we're going to take out taxes for income taxes because those need to be paid as well. We're going to add back depreciation because that's a non-cash expense. And then adding back term interest payments uh, because we're going to take those out on the bottom. So, and then we're going to divide that number that we get, that repayment number, and divide it by term interest and principal demand. So that, that's really your total payment amount. So if you have uh, $150,000 of income, uh, after you add back family or you take out family living and income taxes and add back depreciation and interest, uh, and that number comes up 150,000, and your term debt payments are 100,000, you'd be at that 1.5 risk level, so that you're doing a very good job. If if both those numbers were the same, that $100,000 and you have $100,000 of payments, that you know is enough for this year's payment. But if we go back to those three main reasons of default, being able to withstand that market volatility is really key. So yeah, this year you might have enough to cover those payments, but what if happens if next year there's a drought and your crops don't do as well or prices fall, um, you know, then, then you're having to dig into your working capital or, or selling some assets in order to make your payments. And we don't want you to do that. We wanna make sure you have a little extra cushion there to, to cover your payments. A couple other points on capacity. You know, there is a difference between what your taxes show and what your real income is, and we understand that. We know that uh, most people want to mitigate uh, uh, taxable income. They don't want to pay more taxes than they have to. Uh, you may uh, prepay uh, for feed or, or seed at year end in order to bulk up your expenses and reduce that taxable income or you may hold grain over to next year so you don't have as much income coming in. Uh, and that's really where it comes down to, you know, like we talked about earlier, having those year-end balance sheets uh, put together because we can utilize those year-end balance sheets and look at it from one year to the next to know how much money did you really make you know, with your tax return um, you know, in order to, to fully understand your operation. Um, so, you know, and a couple other points in, in on capacity as well. If you've got multiple businesses, make sure you're breaking those down by enterprise. Uh, you know, you may have a grain operation and then a cattle operation. Uh, one might be making tons of money and the other one might be losing some money, uh, but overall it looks like you're making money. And so, uh, you know, you could be making more money if you drop that operation that's losing money. Uh, so, you know, making sure you're doing those enterprise budgets to know what's making money and what's not is really important. The next piece of the puzzle that we want to talk about is that collateral. And what collateral is, is pledged to security for repayment of a loan to be forfeited in the event of a default. We really, uh, we've got to get collateral right, but we, we never want to have to get to the point uh, that, that we have to get to the point where we have to sell collateral uh, to be able to, to make a, a loan right or adjust, a, adjust to a balance. And so um, some things to consider when we're thinking about collateral is what is its market value and how 
how easy is it to resell? When Lee and I were sitting down to do my balance sheet, uh, I, I was given a tractor from my grandpa and uh, it was an international A. It's the tractor that he learned on. It was the tractor that my mom learned how to drive a tractor on and now I have it. And to me, that tractor is worth Micah, we lost you. It would need to be resold. Micah, can you go back there? Um, the, you you stop there for a second. Uh, you were talking about the tractor uh, that you've had and your dad had and your grand grandfather had. That's are you able you stopped. to stop? You able to hear me, Lee? Yes. All right. Uh, I apologize. And so what's really important is, is that tractor is worth so much to me because it has a personal keepsake to it, right? Uh, but that's not necessarily what the true value of, of that piece of equipment could be. And so when you're sitting down and thinking through uh, the different things that you have on your operation that you may use as collateral, it's really important to think about what that true market value is and how easy it is uh, to resell. And so if you uh, get into a situation where you're talking with Farm Credit about out a collateral value. Uh, it's, not a, it's not something that we're trying to insult you by and say it's not actually worth that. It's just sometimes we do have to discount uh, different pieces of equipment uh, to be able to, to make sure that it is able to resell and we can get a realistic value out of it. And the final C that we're going to talk about tonight is conditions. And so conditions are, are the terms of your loans. So we're looking at, you know, is it a fixed rate or a variable rate? You know, those fixed rates lock in that, that interest rate over the life of the loan, while a variable rate uh, will adjust, uh, you know, sometimes monthly, sometimes, you know, every year, sometimes three years. Uh, so, you know, there, there are times where if we're in a really low interest rate environment, it'd be a great idea to, to lock in that interest rate for the next, you know, 25 years uh, because that takes out the risk of those prices, that interest rate going up and uh, you having to pay more interest on that loan. And on higher interest rate periods, uh, the variable rate might be a great idea uh, where you, you get a low, little lower rate um, and, and hope that those rates come down over time. So uh, we usually like, a, like to recommend you know, a mixture of those you know, for most operations. Uh, you know, if you do, if you are tighter on on repayment capacity on on that uh, debt coverage ratio, we may recommend locking that interest rate in on more of your loans, just so that it takes that risk out of there. Uh, the other pieces of conditions are are the term of the of the loan. So, you know, is it a five year term, a twenty five year term? Uh, you know, how long is the loan? Uh, it may include joint checks or assignments or you know, verification of assets or, or down payment. Those type of things would be a condition of, 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 of loans as well. Uh, and really, those are, all these conditions are very important. They help us mitigate our risk for our cooperative and make sure that we're giving you the right terms uh, for your loan uh, that, that, you're, that you want to take out. Lee, when we're talking about uh, term on a loan, let's say that I had some beef cattle out in the pasture and I uh, just went out and bought these and now I'm saying, Lee, I want these on a 25 year term. They're market steers. I want them on a 25 year term because maybe over this next year, my payment is gonna be nice and small and then I'll be able to, to get so much more cash out of them because I'm gonna be making such a small payment. What do you think about that? Yeah, that, yeah we've had that discussion with, with some customers before and that, yeah, that is great cash flow for the first year or two because it, it's gonna be a really low payment, but you know, come five years from now, 10 years from now, where are those cows? Those are long gone typically, and now you're still making that you know 20 or 20 you know 15 year payment left while there is no cattle around. So you know we would not uh, not allow that you know from our side of things to to do a 25 year for cattle. Yeah, you know, we'd limit that typically you know for breeding livestock to a five typically a five year term on those.
So, yeah, for every factor that, that we, you know, we look at, uh, we evaluate in our credit decision, there is an associated risk. And, and really the ultimate decision comes down to, are you a risk worth, worth ta taking? Uh, and, and, you know, we factor in all these, these five C's that we just talked about and, and really try to understand your operation in depth to, to see if you're a risk worth taking as we uh, evaluate your loan request there. If anyone does have any questions at this time, do feel free to uh, go ahead and put those in the chat box and, and Lee, when, Lee and I would be happy uh, to get, get you the answers to those questions. And if there are none, I'm gonna uh, stop sharing my screen here and, and um, we're gonna kick it back over to Tim. Thanks guys. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, Evan Hirschberger. Uh, Evan's with uh, the Hummel Group and uh, super excited to have, uh, uh, have the Hummel Group here with us tonight. Great partners, great uh, advisors and insurance agents. Um, and Evan's gonna talk a little bit about farm liability. Well, thanks for the introduction, Tim. And um, good evening to everyone out there and welcome. I grew up on a small beef and hay farm in Eastern Holmes County. Um, still operate that today with my brother and my father. Still enjoy getting out and in the evenings and weekends and doing that. My day job, I've been blessed. Um, I've been with Hummel Group for 15 years, the last eight or so exclusively working with ag clients and ag related clients. I would probably say that I'm more passionate about the ag industry than, than the insurance industry, um, but have been blessed in the insurance side of things to work mainly with ag clients. Get the commercial for Nationwide out of, out of the way uh, in the beginning and then work right into the farm liability section of this. As I said, I've been um, with Hummel brief background there. We're an independent agency. What that means is we work with many different insurance companies and we have access to many different insurance companies. And, and one of the things that, that you will hear them all say, everybody wants to work with us on, on farm insurance. And that's what they all say. Um, and about four years ago, nationwide, we had the opportunity to develop a relationship with them. They came on board, they said the same thing, but I think the thing that differentiates them from a lot of our different carriers is that they take the action steps. They don't just say that they want to write farm insurance and do it well. They take the action steps to, to make that happen. And four different areas that I've seen them do that, 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 um, really points that out is, is they've got products developed specifically for farmers, um, a whole portfolio of products, and, and they keep that portfolio fresh and current and, and up to date with products that, that farmers need um, as the industry changes. Secondly, I think they've got knowledgeable people across the whole entire company um, and experts in the field. They've got experts helping us as agents put policies together in the underwriting departments. They've got experts in the claim side of things, helping you as farmers, if something bad does happen, work through that situation. Um, we had a situation this year, and I did not know this, um, they have a team in their claims department that is specifically dedicated to handling claims, overspray and pollution related claims. And everybody on that team is either a certified crop advisor or has some type of agronomy background. And the professionalism and expertise that they bring to handling those pollutions and over, over spray claims, drift claims, unmatched, I would say, in the industry. Third, third area, third action item is, is they're flexible. Um, it's kind of an interesting mix when we talk about in the insurance industry and the ag industry. The insurance industry kind of builds their products and builds out things. Um, best way for me to say this is, is to fit in a box. And, and you think on the other side of that, in the ag industry, uh, you, you get praised or we get praised for thinking outside of the box or, or uh, figuring out new ways to do things. So when you envision meshing those two industries together, it can sometimes be interesting. But Nationwide has taken the action step of being flexible, taking that box and twisting it and, and doing whatever they need when it makes sense to, to put the products out there and, and, and be flexible for their clients. 
And then the fourth thing, and it's kind of the obvious thing, and it's the thing that everybody wants to think about first, probably, is that, that they've been competitive when it comes to pricing. And are they always the cheapest? Well, maybe not. But when, from a, from a value standpoint, when you, when you talk about the products that they have, the expertise that they have, the flexibility that they have, and then you pair that all with how competitive they are, I don't think that, that anyone else in the industry can, can match the value as a whole. So um, there's my commercial for, for Nationwide, um, and honestly what I've seen in working with them for, for the last several years. And um, at this point, Tim, I think we're gonna jump right into to the, the presentation on farm liability. Um, there's your disclaimer till I get done speaking. Um, maybe there should have been a couple more pages there. But uh, this slide, this slide comes back to, the, to my first point in product. Um, they've got product developed across the board and in, in in whether it's in relation to, the, to your family, to your business, to your future. Um, there's products out there that, that are solutions for all of life, life's moments, as it says. Um, I'm sure, sure Carl will talk about some things later on as in relation to your future. Um, I'll probably hit more on, on the middle part of this when we're talking about the, the business side of things or the farm side of things. But, but a way maybe to summarize this slide is, is Nationwide helping the ag industry manage risk through the use of insurance and financial strategies. This here just kind of gives you an overview of a base farm policy. One thing that really struck me this, this week or the last several weeks as I was looking at this, um, I think in the industry and, and, and as clients, we focus so much on the first couple items, whether, whether it be your, your farm equipment coverage, your building coverage. And sometimes, right or wrong, we gloss over the, the farm liability section. That's where we're gonna spend our time this evening. I think part of it is, is you might have to do a little bit of work, but you can, you can kind of come up with the answers on, on the first several items there. You might have to, to call a builder and, and have a conversation about, well, what would it cost to replace my home or replace my farm structures if something major happened? You might have to get out on tractor house or call your implement dealer and, and talk about well, what, what's my equipment really worth. But at the end of the day on those items, you can usually get dialed into a number and know and, and develop an insurance program for those items. Sometimes when it comes to liability, it's, it's not quite that easy. And, and even if you would ask me now from a from a farm liability, what's enough coverage and and sometimes even as agents, we skirt, we skirt or, or avoid the answering that question. Um, the answer that, that I would give you is, is buy what you can for, afford and then maybe buy a little bit more. Um, I would say from, from an advisory standpoint, we, we try to look at or, or get clients to look at net worth um, from an asset side of things and at least have in that, that amount of liability out there. Um, I, I will plug, at this moment, li uh, liability and uh, umbrella policies. And, and if you're on the call and, and you don't know what an umbrella policy is or, or you haven't talked with your agent about it, um, you haven't looked at it, reviewed it, I would say that is something to definitely put on the to-do list. Um, get with your agent, have an on your side review, ask them about liability coverage. If nothing else, talk about umbrella coverage and, and price it out. Um, liability coverage, just a real big little, little overview here. We're going to spend most of the time on bodily injury, bodily injury and property damage. There are some other pieces in it. Um, there's defense coverage and, and some other things. Um, but we're going to spend some time tonight on bodily injury and property damage. Four main categories. Um, they're outlined here. There's premises liability. There's operations liability, pollution liability and product liability. Premises liability, fairly straightforward. It has to do with, um, with your property and, and, and things that could um, happen on your property where someone sustains an injury or damage. Um, operations liability, it has to do with, um, could, could also happen on your property, but it has to do more with operations, um, injuries, property damage relating 
to you operating the farm. We'll get into specifics here in a minute. Product liability, um, damage or injury to someone through the use or, or maybe eating one of your products, probably more so from the farm side on, on the actual eating of the product. Pollution liability, um, this one here talks about the escape of pollutants directly from your farm or ranch. There's many different categories that go beyond that in the pollution side of things. I think right along with umbrella coverage, it's one of the most important things um, today that is probably uh, undersold on and, and not talked about enough. We'll get into it a little bit deeper here in a minute. Um, premises liability, again, has to do on your farm or ranch property, fairly straightforward. Um, the middle part of this slide talks about the, the level of care, um, depending on what type of visitor your, is at your property or at your farm. And, and it kind of comes down to the common sense principle. I would say that anyone, any friends or, or business people that you have out, you're telling them if there's hazards about your property um, and alerting them. Obviously, if somebody's trespassing, that's not, you don't have the, the responsibility to, to maybe let them know about some of the hazards on your property. Um, areas of concern, slip and fall, swimming pools, things that can happen on the property. Dog bite is one that, that maybe the general public glosses over a little bit, but if you talk to claims, I think from a severity and frequency standpoint, it's one of the most common and, and costly claims that, um, that comes up. And, and things can happen, accidents can happen. Um, we had an incident where, with a dog bite that I don't think anybody did anything wrong. It was an incident where there was a gathering at a farm. Um, the gathering went late into the evening. There was a black lab, older black lab dog that had a loss of hearing that, um, that was the owner's dog. And at the end of the night, one of the, one of the visitors, one of the friends was leaving accidentally that was laying in the front yard near the driveway and Black Lab was sound asleep, can't hear very well, obviously disoriented. And I think when the incident happened, the dog thought it was being attacked and its natural instinct was to bite what was ever, whatever was attacking it. Um, ended up in some facial reconstruction surgery, some plastic surgery. And, and very quickly, you can see the importance of premise liability in that situation out of an incident that, that farmer probably never thought would occur. The, the dog wasn't provoked, never had a history, um, but accidents happen. And that's one that I like. I don't really like it, but I guess it's, it's an example of a true accident taking place. Agritourism is one that we, we throw that word out there and that, that's an automatic word for an on your side review. Anything with that going on, on on your premise, you need to to talk to your to your agent, get in touch with them. Most likely a base farm liability policy isn't going to address some of the business exposures and commercial exposures that, um, that go with a typical agritourism or agritainment risk. Operations, um, again, fairly straightforward. Most common claims out there probably have to deal with, with equipment, um, in the road and and livestock in the road and and this is something that the base farm policy addresses not only will it cover um, some of the base things on your property but it will follow you um, in your operations on the road um, if cattle get out like I said and and um, with equipment on the road product liability um, some of the basic things that you might do off of a farm would, would be included. Um, I have a common example that I've seen recently, if, if you're wholesaling um, sweet corn, or if, if you're selling sweet corn that's obviously not processed direct from the farm, it's probably something that the base policy is going to address. You do anything different beyond that, and again, I think it generates a conversation with, with your nationwide agent or with your agent um, to talk about exactly what you're doing in adding the proper coverages or the proper endorsements and making sure you're covered, whether it be farm stands, whether you're processing and, and selling jellies or, or apple butter, things like that. 
just making sure that, that you have the, the, um, the correct product liability. Got a good example. Um, Nationwide helped us on this account where we have a dairy in the state of Ohio that, that um, makes their own cheese. And that is something that is definitely outside of the base policy. Um, Nationwide, one of those characteristics that I talked about early was that, they were, that they're flexible. Um, we were able to put together the right commercial coverage pieces and the right farm pieces to, to cover the product liability for the cheese, the increased exposure that they have on their premise from customers coming on and off. And then also from an operations standpoint, um, they're selling that cheese at different farm markets and that liability is gonna follow them um, to those farm markets and, and pick up that exposure as well. So um, again, that comes back to, to them having the conversation with us and, and nationwide working with us and anything like that that you're doing out there, I would say just making, make sure that you're having conversations with, with your agent. Pollution is one that, um, that I would say that, that, that our agency and the, and the people that I work with are fairly passionate about. Um, again, if this is something as a, as a livestock farmer, as a row crop farmer that you have not address with your agent. I think it's something that you probably need to put on the to-do list and, and fairly soon. Um, many of the policies out there, including a nationwide policy, is fairly limited on, on what a base policy will cover when it comes to pollution. Um, but nationwide has the products and, and, and all of them that are needed to address the, the different areas, whether it be chemical drift and overspray, whether it be um, an off-premise spill, um, whether it be an on-premise spill, um, and, and they will obviously address manure as well. A lot of this again comes down to having a conversation with your agent. Um, if you're a large row crop farmer, you're doing all of your own spraying, um, you're storing liquid, uh, liquid, nit liquid 28 fertilizer um, throughout the year, um, livestock where you have uh, a dairy operation, liquid manure, I think it becomes more crucial to you versus someone who maybe comes and says, you know, um, solid manure, dry fertilizer, um, the co-op sprays for me. And again, I think those are two different examples and, and both probably need to address it in one form or another, but maybe you go about it different ways. And it's all about, again, having the conversation with your, with your agent, figuring out what your risk is, what you're doing, and appropriately covering your, your operation from a pollution side. Just a quick review here. We've talked about premises liability, we've talked about operations liability, we've talked about pollution liability and product liability. And we'll go through a couple of examples of each here. Um, there is a video that goes with that last slide that does not um, work well with, with the technology that we're using this evening. So I did watch it earlier. And, and the general idea there is, is that a nationwide agent came out and addressed the shortcomings in the pollution coverage for this dairy operation that you see photoed here. Um, there, there wasn't addressed in the prior policy. Um, nationwide took over the policy and was able to address it and, and um, deal with the exposures of, of the different manure pits that this large dairy has and, and have the proper coverages that if there was some type of a spill or some type of a leak that, um, that it would be covered. So just a couple of reminders there, the base policy provides a limited coverage um, and, but you can, you can, there's a full line of products to address that and specific to, to the different operations. And, and main point there again, talk to your agent. Second example, um, you have a situation where there is a corn maze um, in the parking lot where there are parking vehicles for this corn maze. Um, someone apparently had mowed the grass at one point. It was a dry field. A um, the car came in that that um, the hot car came in and and uh, dripped some type of a of a of a liquid or somehow started the field on fire. And you can see the result um, in the picture. So. Um, how do you address this? I guess in, in a perfect world, maybe you could figure out whose car um, started the fire and if they had a really good liability policy 
maybe you could direct it back at them. Probably more realistically is what happen, happens is, is farmer um, or the, the person that's running the corn maze um, is on the hook for this, for this liability loss. And this is, this is a type of aggertainment um, that the base policy most likely is not going to address especially if you are charging the visitors to your farm to, to take part in the corn maze. And that's kind of where I guess the line in the sand gets drawn. Anything that, that's going on on the farm where you're charging and, and there's dollars being exchanged is, is where you really need to talk to the agent. I would talk to your agent either way, but you really need to talk to your agent, make sure you have the, the proper coverages. This is an example of a premise, premises liability. Um, as you can see there, charging a fee is considered a business pursuit, which is not covered in the base policy. Business pursuit needs a separate general liability insurance. Talk to your agent. Um, this, this example, I don't necessarily like all that well, but we'll talk about it. Um, it the, the question at the top of the screen is, is this a slow moving vehicle? And, and I don't know if um, anybody is picking up on, on what they're trying to say with that, but this is, this is a tractor that has speared a round bale and is going down the road and there's not, an, not a visible um, SMV or slow moving vehicle sign. Um, and, and that's what they're getting at. Um, it's a bad example, I think, because probably many people on the call have done this. I myself have done this. Um, and, and I don't think you're going to find many farmers out there that will slap an SMV on, on a round bale as they're going down the road. Um, but again, the idea is, is the importance of liability coverage. Someone hits you in the rear, uh, no, matter, no matter, I guess, what, what you think about that personally. Um, if you don't have a visible SMV, you might be liable for that type of an accident. And so um, I, this, this is just another example of where liability can be important. Um, an accident can happen so quick and, and you, may, you may think nothing, will, nothing like that will ever happen, happen so fast. Um, kind of giving the, the answer to this one away as far as what, what, the, um, what the example is, but this is something that's off premise that would be more of an operations type exposure as you're on the road with equipment. There you can see protection on and off the farm. Um, again, key in to, to talk to your agent about exactly what operations you have on the farm and, and make sure you're covering all your bases from a liability standpoint. Um, picture of apples there, you, you, can, you can see, um, we got a farmer that's selling apples um, to the public and you've got someone that has an allergic reaction or maybe you have someone that takes a bite and, and chips or cracks a tooth. Um, and so they, they, um, there's, there's injury that, um, has to do with the sale of those apples. And that one, that one's under product liability. Again, just to review there a little bit, the farm policy primarily covers wholesale. So in that scenario given, if you're just wholesaling or, or, or selling apples, um, base policy would probably work for you. If you're doing more, if you're making apple butter, if you're processing the, the um, if you're processing the fruit or the vegetables in any way, if you're selling goods um, or processed foods of others, um, you, you need to talk to your agent and just make sure um, that the, the proper liabilities, proper endorsements are there. And, I know we've talked, I've talked a lot about endorsements and, and I, I don't want that to be a scary word. I, I, I don't want that, want, don't want you to think there's a lot more money involved with, with many of these endorsements. Um, it's a lot easier for us as the agent to have that conversation and tell you that something's included or, or this is how we address it and price it for you as opposed to sitting across from you and, and, and having some type of event that's already happened and having to tell you that, well, that's not covered because it's not addressed. Um, very, very easy conversations to have. Um, we never get tired of, of hearing from our farm clients. So next slide, Tim. Um, why nationwide? I, I kind of alluded to it, I think, in, in the beginning as, as far as 
what I see personally. Um, and one of the key things here, the, the last quote um, is from that dairy farmer um, that was one of the examples on the pollution side of things. It's a history you can trust. Nationwide seems to understand our business. Right from the top, there's people on the board of directors from Nationwide that are farmers themselves and understand that there's risks involved that you have to protect yourself. I think that's the key with Nationwide is from the top down, they have people that are passionate about agriculture. They have people on the board that, that are farmers. And I think that is something that they will, will continue to do over time and, and they really key in and, and that's important to them. Next slide, Tim. Um, just a couple of key takeaways to finish up. Um, you know, accidents happen. Um, even, even a lot of people think, well, that'll never happen to me. They happen so fast. They happen in areas where, where you'd never anticipate that they would happen. Um, make sure you're covered. Um, and, and then the other key thing here is don't assume everything is covered. If you do something different, if you do something new on the farm, um, farm or ranch or in your ag industry, make sure you have that conversation. Make sure you have that on your side review with your agent to, to address um, key changes or, or different operations. Um, like I said, it's always easier to have that conversation on the front side than, than having to deliver back news on, on the back side. Um, share stories with, with others. I, you know, I, I drive around the state of Ohio. I, I look at policies. Um, there are so many farmers out there on the insurance side of things, whether it be liability and property or property that, that need help. Um, you know, there, there are good agents out there. Um, and I know insurance isn't always the thing that comes up when you're out for dinner or, or um, out for drinks, but when, when the opportunity presents itself, um, if you have a good agent, share that with other farmers. If, if you know of a good nationwide agent, share that with farmers. If you don't have access to anyone else, I'll gladly talk with you. And I know Tim will share our information later, but um, you know there are people out there in the insurance industry that care about the ag industry. And, and we'd be glad to, we love working with farmers, glad to help. Hey, thanks so much, Evan. Uh, I thought that was, I thought it was great. Um, you know, the topic of uh, farm liability coverage and uh, insurance is not always the most sexy, you know, uh, piece of information that folks want to talk about, but boy, is it important to have the right coverage and the right policy. If I caught a theme in the, in the information that you shared uh, among several, it's hey, talk, talk to your agent uh, and, and work with an agent that you trust and that knows your, knows your business, uh, like folks at Hummel and, and others in the area. So I really appreciate you uh, taking that over. So Carl, uh, go ahead and, and, and bring us home. Well, again, my name is Carl Slaybaum with uh, the Hummel Group um, as well. Been with them for 23 years now. Um, much like Evan, I grew up on a small dairy farm in Holmes County, uh, probably within 10 miles of Evan, actually. Um, known him for a long time. Um, unlike him, I'm not as active on the farm anymore. I do wish, however, that I could be out on beautiful days at times, sitting on the tractor and mowing hay all day like I used to growing up. So um, I still enjoy that, at least dreaming about it uh, in that sense. But um, want to talk a little bit tonight about life insurance. Um, life insurance is a financial tool. Um, Micah and Lee alluded to it earlier tonight as well. Um, life insurance is not the most fun topic uh, to talk about. People probably the, one of the most hesitant discussions people have. My wife hates talking about uh, life insurance. However, it's a very important piece of your financial plan. And it's and it's, it's the, the the key to that is that it protects what matters most to you, and that's your family. Um, you can never replace an individual that passes away, um, but you can at least have some tools that help provide some financial support in the event of an untimely death. And so, um, you know, as Evan mentioned, we are an independent agency. We represent a number of companies. Um, as Evan has done, he's on the ag side. I, I focus mostly on the financial side and we work with a lot of insurance companies. However, 
with Nationwide, how they separate themselves um, is that not only do they have those products, but they have that desire to be connected with the ag community as well. And one of those uh, is not just the products themselves, but they also have a program that's called Land is Your Legacy um, that's developed to help transition uh, plan for farmers. And I'll talk a little bit about more of that later, but they put that extra effort into not just providing products, but helping clients understand how to use those products properly in their plan. Okay. <clears throat> Overview of what we're going to talk about a little bit. Um, obviously, life changes. Um, your needs change. Uh, in relation to life insurance, we'll, we'll talk about some scenarios and steps of uh, stages of where that takes place. And then also just talk, so, talk about what the types of life insurance are that are out there. What's the right fit for you? Whoops, sorry. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit, we'll give three uh, phases we'll talk about. So what kind of situations um, may need the, the, uh, the coverage for life insurance? Um, so we'll talk about three of them. One, beginning of uh, the beginning farmer, somebody get, just getting started off on their operation, um, getting established, and then an established farm, something that's been in operation for a period of time, running, running smoothly and efficiently, and um, you know just uh, hitting their stride. And then also the the third stage uh, transition planning. You know how do you transition the land to the next generation? um in in that sense so we'll look at those different different stages so for those that are just getting started that's um a lot of the important things a lot of that it's it's debt replacement and income replacement so um as mike had talked about you know obviously one of the things that they look at is collateral um if they have debt that's outstanding the bank a lot of times wants to have coverage in place to protect that outstanding liability. So how much debt's taken on um, by building that operation? Um, secondly, just income wise, you know, if you're in the operation starting off, you, you're doing this to not only as a, it's just a lifestyle, but it's also for a, a living for your family. You're there to support your family uh, with an income. And if you have an unexpected loss to you, of your life, how does your family continue to be provided for since your income is lost? So uh, a way to do that is with life insurance to replace that future income. So for the next phase, someone who's more established, um, there may be different, different um, issues that come up in those discussions. One, uh, what, what happens, uh, you maybe have a more, more people on staff than just you uh, starting off the operation when you were younger, you've now grown to where you have multiple employees. Uh, you may have a key employee that you rely on and depend on for that operation to be successful. Uh, what happens if something uh, would, would happen untimely to that, that key employee? Would that jeopardize the risk to the operation? Um, can the operation continue to function if that happens? Um, so there's, there's maybe a need for some life insurance for that key employee. Um, again, also what, what kind of coverage to help protect the business um, or collateral, collateralize for a loan, you know, whether you're, you've got an operating loan, uh, whatever loan outstanding you may have, um, there may be the requirements through the bank to collateralize the debt benefit or maybe the cash value of those life insurance policies um, in that situation. And then the, the third phase is, is those that are transitioning. So you're coming to uh, their, you know, their, their later stages and they're, they're passing on the enterprise to the next generation. So how does that happen efficiently? How can we make that work well? So um, we'll look at an example. How do you divide that asset, the assets completely uh, fairly? Um, how does that work well? And that's a lot of times accomplished with what's called survivorship life insurance. We'll talk about that um, a little bit later on in some more details, but um, that's just a situation. What, what, what may come into play for someone who's in that transition phase? 
And it kind of, you know, how does life insurance also work for any, any stage there too? One of the things that's also, um, that's also becoming more popular is that life insurance is being incorporated with long-term care. So it's a kind of a hybrid approach. So whether it's coverage where you don't just necessarily have to pass away, it's if you need long-term care that also pays out a benefit for that as well. So there are circumstances where medical costs can incur large unexpected uh, bills to a farm or an individual and how does that impact your financial future down the road. So some of those, uh, some of those coverages also include some long-term care uh, features in that and that's some, some issues to address at that point. One thing that's for certain is that we never get any younger. And most times as we get older, our health doesn't improve uh, down the road. We usually, uh, our health declines. Um, so obviously the younger you are and the healthier you are, the better the insurance costs are in, in all those scenarios with life insurance and, and uh, long-term care. So we're gonna dig into the details a little bit about the different types of, in, of, of life insurance. Um, the first one that you've heard of is, is probably term life insurance. Um, oops, sorry, term life insurance is very simple. Um, the, 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 it's, a, it's a use it or lose it type of policy, right? Um, I, I call it an if policy. If you die, the company pays the benefit. And if that happens within the term or time frame of that coverage, then that is paid out, okay? So that often is, is a, a term period from 10, 15, 20, up to 30 years uh, that that policy is in place. So if you pass away during that time frame, the benefit is paid. If you, you, you don't pass away, then that's lost. Um, it's kind of like renting uh, a policy. Um, the benefits to that obviously is that there is some flexibility. Um, you typically have lower costs to that because the insurance company is only on the hip hook if you pass away. So not all the policies pay out. So it spreads the cost and keeps the cost lower. Um, one advantage to term insurance is a lot of times there's a feature within those policies that allow you the opportunity to convert that to a permanent policy later down the road. So it's kind of a backdoor fail safe option to continue later on. Um, when you get term insurance, typically you do that when you're younger, you, 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 when that policy is locked in place, you qualify at a certain health class. And with the conversion options, most of those companies allow you to convert to a permanent policy while you maintain the current health class that you, uh, you received at the term policy. So same example, if you apply when you're younger and healthier, you get good rates when you're young. When you get to the end of the term policy and you may not have the same health uh, as you did earlier, you can convert to a permanent policy, paying those preferred rates and carry that forward. So it's an extra way to kind of help you down the road. Not all companies carry that, not all policies have that, but it is a great opportunity if someone has that in their policy on the term, it's an important feature. Quick example, a little bit on just, you know, how much uh, term coverage would look like. And again, this example, um, those numbers are fairly low. That's going to be based on a very young individual, but you can see you can get a lot of coverage for a fairly low amount of dollars to protect, um, you know, whatever it is that you're trying to cover. Um, talking a little bit about that conversion option. Um, I have a client that, you know, a farm client where husband and wife have term policies in place right now. They are not looking to do some permanent policies until later. They can't do that because they're currently making other payments on some financing. But once they wrap that up, they're going to be able to convert those policies and continue later on. But so that's a, 
that's a benefit of those term policies that give you that option to purchase permanent down the road without having to prove that you're insurable later on. Whole life, whole life or permanent insurance, another term there, um, this is more of a when policy. Uh, so I said, you know, a term is if, whole life is a when. Uh, so when you take out a policy with a whole life or permanent policy, that coverage is for the, the entire lifetime. Um, and the insurance company will, will pay that death benefit out at some point. Obviously, it's in place until you pass away. Um, so some of the other benefits to that, some of the policies will also build some cash value um, that can be used in, in addition to the death benefit. There's some tax benefits potentially as well. Um, and like, again, I mentioned, you know, you get access to some of the funds. If you're terminally ill, they may pay that out ahead of time, um, potentially as well. So we mentioned a little bit the benefit of some cash value build up in a life insurance policy. Some of the advantages that you can use that policy cash is that you can, you can supplement some other things that you're doing besides just having the life insurance in place. Uh, so it may provide a little extra retirement income. It might help fund college education, replace some equipment. Uh, just another resource you could tap into in the event you need some extra cash. Long-term care. Um, reason we're talking about long-term care a little bit with this life insurance piece is that traditional long-term care was just that. It was a long-term care insurance policy, a standalone policy, um, and those are still available today. Uh, but we've seen a increase in what are called linked policies or life insurance policies with a long-term care rider. At the end of the day, there's a number of ways to design this, and it, the, the bottom line is that these types of policies create a pool of money that you can access for long-term care down the road. And there's some different structural designs and, and, you know, but at the end of the day, it's there's dollars that can be leveraged to create a benefit to help pay for long-term care um, benefits. If they're not used for long-term care, then would be passed on as a death benefit to uh, the beneficiaries. Another type of policy, is a survivorship life insurance policy. Um, those situations used when you're continuing a business, um, family protection, estate planning. Um, primarily we see this in the estate planning side. Um, give you a good example of this. What happens to the business and the family if you become disabled or pass away? So this is a good example and this is maybe common, uh, but you have for example, mom and dad, call them Joe and Sally, um, that have a survivorship life insurance policy. The survivorship means when both people pass away. So both people have to pass before the insurance company pays out the benefit. But in the event of that, um, the insurance benefit is paid out. The, the benefit in the scenario that's exam as this example here is, this may be a situation where you may have three kids um, uh, that are th uh, of the of the parents, and only one of them may be actively involved in the business. So, junior on the right hand side there may be getting the 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 real estate or the farm, and that's his portion of the estate that he receives from mom and dad. Um, the other two kids on the left hand side may not at be actively involved in the business they may be receiving um, the life insurance benefits to help balance the estate so that, that it, is, it is distributed fairly and equitably to every, all the, the parties involved in that case. That's just one good example of when a second to die or survivorship policy is used. Looking at needs for life insurance, I mean, the biggest thing is obviously get started, you know, review your existing coverage. 
Um, I, the main thing I tell people is like, what, what is the purpose? What, what do you want your insurance to accomplish? Um, if, if you're looking to cover outstanding debt, you know, a mortgage, anything that's outstanding from a liability standpoint, term insurance works very well because it matches up with the term of the loan. And a lot of times the banks may require some collateral with that, or we're just ask that you have life insurance in place. Um, that's a key starting point. And primarily I say it's important to have the right amount of coverage, not necessarily the type. No one ever asks what type of insurance we the, the, uh, a client had if they've passed away. They just ask, did they have life insurance? So it's not necessarily the type that makes it any better it's if you have it in place. Next step, just determining how much you need. That really just comes down to reinforcing the whole conversation of working with trusted advisors. I mean, I think, you know, you heard Lee and Micah earlier, just great resources to tap into. Evan talking earlier, you know, talk with those that have worked with other cases before and have worked with the products and just say, look, what's the right amount for your situation? So talk through everybody's situation is unique. Work with a trusted advisor. Um, and then it's key that they understand the role of life insurance in your overall plan. Uh, again, I mentioned the Land is Your Legacy program that Nationwide has put together. It's a nice program that the um, Nationwide uh, agents and, and individuals can help work with you and to develop a plan to transition your farm uh, with the guidance of the expertise of Nationwide uh, internally uh, to, to leverage that and help come up with plans and ideas. And life insurance is gonna be a part of that plan. So you wanna understand how does that fit in your overall, overall plan um, as, as, as it um, relates to your situation and your conversations. I guess I kind of covered that in the last part, so I apologize. But yeah, you know, talk to some advisors that you uh, trust. Make sure you get in touch with them, resources that are, that are helpful to you. Uh, we appreciate the time. Obviously, it's been a long night here, and uh, I really appreciate your attention. And if you have any questions, our contact information is there. Thanks so much, Carl. Uh, great information, uh, pretty dense information. Uh, you covered a lot of ground in a few short minutes. So I really appreciate you taking the time tonight. Um, so that concludes tonight's program. I would remind everybody that this is part of a, a series. So there's additional programs on farm transition planning, uh, as well as retirement planning. So if you uh, found tonight's program useful, uh, uh, please make sure to uh, help spread the word uh, in this uh, in this period of of uh, uh, shelter in place and uh, kind of working remotely. Uh, we're trying to do what we can to help deliver some quality information uh, to our members and those in the ag community across the state. So uh, with that, I really appreciate uh, everyone's time. 